Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're going to talk about counting. So with this we're starting a new section and at first it might seem that counting is a simple thing, right? But it actually turns out that it's extremely important in math. Being able to count the number of ways an event can turn out, a process can be performed, or objects will be created is extremely useful in business, science, economics, medicine, and a huge variety of fields. And at first you're probably thinking, well, I could just count them, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, and be able to be done with counting. Why turn it into a thing in math? Well, sure, that's true, but what if you need to count a hundred of something, or you need to count a thousand of something, or the thing that you're trying to count is a million large? You can't count a million of a thing by hand with any reasonable amount of time, right? That's going to take you more than a year to count a million of something out by hand. So we need some way to be able to count on a large scale, and that's why math does an actual major study of counting, how to count all sorts of different things. And that's what we'll be exploring in this lesson and the next two lessons. The formal study of counting is called combinatorics. And this course will barely scratch the surface of combinatorics. Still, we'll manage to see some really important results that allow us to show all sorts of really interesting, cool things. The basic ideas are intuitive, they make a lot of sense, but we can exploit them to answer really difficult questions, and it won't be very hard for us to do at all. All right, let's go. So first we're going to define the idea of an event. An event is something happening. It's simply something happening, and it can occur in some number of different ways. If we want, we can denote an event with a symbol, such as capital E, and similarly we can talk about the number of ways that the event can occur. We might use a symbol for that as well, and we could denote it with some N. So we've got some event that can occur in multiple ways. For example, someone might give you a cookie, right? And you are allowed to choose from three types of cookie. Uh, chocolate chip, snickerdoodle, or peanut butter. So we've got three different types of cookie that can come out of this. The event E is getting a cookie, and the way that it can turn out is three different ways, chocolate chip, snickerdoodle, or peanut butter. So there's this event, but it doesn't necessarily have a single way of turning out, because we could go with the chocolate chip version of the event, the snickerdoodle version of the event, or the peanut butter version of the event, but they're all within the event of getting a cookie. Some teachers won't use the word event. You might see in some textbooks or teachers teaching, they won't use the word event, and they might use a different word to describe it, or they might not use any word at all. That's fine. The important part of all this is just to be aware that certain things have multiple possible outcomes or choices involved. All the coming ideas are going to work fine, whether we're using the word event, or we're using some other word, or we're not really using a word at all. The important thing is just to get this idea of having possibilities, branching possibilities coming out of something. Event is just one way to describe this formally, and that's the way we'll be talking about in this course, but all the basic ideas are going to be the same, whatever vocabulary someone else is using. We can visualize an event. One way to help us visualize an event, or a series of events, as we'll soon see, is with a branching line diagram. So we can have something that breaks off into multiple different directions. At each event in the diagram, it will split into all of its various possible outcomes. In our previous cookie example, we could represent the event with this diagram. So we could split into chocolate chip, snickerdoodle, and peanut butter. So we have this cookie event that splits into the chocolate chip version, the snickerdoodle version, and the peanut butter version. We've got this branching line graph, this branching line diagram that shows us all the different ways that our event can occur. Because we have one event, but it splits into three possibilities. Addition principle. Let there be two events, E1 and E2, where E1 can occur in M ways. So E1 can occur in M ways, and E2 can occur in n ways. If precisely one of the events will occur, not both. So we know that an event will occur, and it will be either E1 or E2, but we don't know which of the two events it's going to be. We just know for sure that it will be one of them when something happens. The total possible ways for something to occur is the number of ways that our first event can occur added to the number of ways that our second event can occur, so m plus n. For our previous example, if we were given a choice between one of the previously mentioned cookies, we can now add on this idea of a scoop of ice cream. So previously we had three different types of cookies, so that would be m equals 3. Or we could have a scoop of ice cream, so we're allowed to have either a cookie or a scoop of ice cream, and the ice cream can be vanilla or chocolate, so that gives us two choices. We've got n equals 2. And then the total possible choices are the m choices, plus the n choices. So our three choices for cookie, 
plus the two choices that we have for ice cream comes out to a total of five possible choices that we can have out of this. We can see this branching like this. If we choose the dessert version of cookie, right, we have this initial thing of we're getting a dessert. Now we have the choice between the cookie event or the ice cream event. So if we go down the cookie event, we can split into chocolate chip, snickerdoodle, or peanut butter. But if we went down the other event, our second event, we can split into vanilla or chocolate. So that gives us two possibilities here, three possibilities here. We count them all together and we get five when we combine all of the things that could happen because we've branched off of the different events. So we have to add up all the possible outcomes. Next, the multiplication principle. This is also called the fundamental counting principle because it's just so very important to the way counting works. Let there be two events, E1 and E2. Once again, E1 can occur in M ways and E2 can occur in N ways. If both events will occur, that is to say, event one is definitely going to occur and event two is definitely going to occur. And we also have to have that they have no effect on each other. So how event one turns out will have no effect on how event two turns out. They are independent events. What happens over here won't affect what happens over here then the total possible ways for something to occur is the number of ways that our first event can occur times the number of ways that our second event can occur. Let's see an example to help us understand why this is. So going back to our previous example, once again expanding on that, the idea of cookies and ice cream, now we're given a choice of one of the previously mentioned cookies, so that was M equals three choices, and a choice of the previously mentioned ice cream scoops. So we're not just getting a cookie or a scoop of ice cream, we are getting both. We are getting a cookie and we are getting a scoop of ice cream. So we've got three possibilities for the scoop of ice, sorry, three possibilities for the cookie choice, and then two possibilities for the scoop of ice cream. That will give us a total possible choices of six. Let's see why that winds up working out. So we get three times two equals six, right? That's M times N. Let's see how this works out. We start off with our first event. Our first event occurs because we're gonna have to get the cookie and then we'll get the ice cream. We could do it the other way and it would work out just as well, but let's say cookie then ice cream. So we choose our cookie choice. So we've got three possible ways for our cookie choice to turn out. We can either have chocolate chip, snickerdoodle, or peanut butter. But then on each one of these choices, we have an expanded two more choices. So whether, if we have chocolate chip, we now have vanilla or chocolate out of that. So that's two here. If we took snickerdoodle, we now have vanilla or chocolate. So that's two here. If we took peanut butter, we now have vanilla or chocolate. So that's two here. So because we have three possible starting branches, when the next two branches come off, we can just multiply the number for each event, right? There's three possibilities that come out of our cookie choice, and then a further two possibilities on top of each of those. So it would be three times two for a total of six in the end. All right. Next idea is the pigeonhole principle. Let there be some event E that can occur in N ways. So we've got some event E and it can happen in N ways. Now, if that event happens N plus one times, so it happens one more than the number of ways the event can turn out. So it has N different possibilities for turning out. And then the event happens one more time than the number of ways it can turn out. We know that one of the ways the event can occur must happen twice. It can also happen more, but we know for sure it will happen at least twice in one of the ways, and it might happen more, but we're guaranteed at least twice in one of the ways. Another way to look at this is with boxes and objects. I think this is a little bit easier to visualize. Equivalently, given n boxes and n plus one objects, if all of the objects are put into the boxes, then at least one box must have at least two objects. Let's use some numbers here so we can see this a little better. So let's say we have three boxes, right? One, two, three boxes. And we're given four objects. One, two, three, four. If we try to fit these four objects into those three boxes, it has to be the case that in one of those boxes, there will be at least two balls. For example, if we try to keep our, these balls separated, so we put this ball in here first, and then we put this ball in here first, and then we put this ball in here first, when we get to this ball here, it has to go into a box that's already been filled. And so whatever of the three boxes it winds up going into, it doesn't matter which one it winds up going into, it's going to wind up going into a box that already has another object in there. And so we will know that we have at least two 
objects. We might have wound up putting all four balls in one box. That's for sure, but that would still say at least one box has at least two objects. So it will wind up being true however we decide to distribute these balls. We can be guaranteed that at least one of the boxes has at least two objects. There might be more boxes that have even more. There might be one box that has all of them, but we know for certain that at least one of them has at least two. In many ways, it's just common sense. It seems a little surprising to see in a mathematical context because it just makes such perfect sense to us intuitively. But we can wind up saying some pretty surprising things by using this idea, as we'll see in example five. Real quick example just to see this applied. If we were given four cookies, and each of our cookies was once again those three choices of chocolate chip, snickerdoodle, and peanut butter, then we know since we were given four cookies and we only have three possibilities, we have to have at least two of one type of cookie, right? We're going to have to have at least two chocolate chips, or at least two snickerdoodles, or at least two peanut butters. We might wind up having many in a different kind, like we might have four chocolate chips or four snickerdoodles or four peanut butters or two chocolate chips and two snickerdoodles and no peanut butters, but we know for certain there's at least one thing where we've got a pairing on the cookie type. Cool. All right, let's get on to, oh, first draw pictures. When working on counting problems, it can help immensely to draw pictures and diagrams. Just being able to visualize this stuff can make it a lot easier to understand. If you can visually follow the events and choices, so if you can see what's going on, how things are branching, it's going to make it that much easier to solve problems. So I really recommend draw pictures. Now, that's not to say that you need to draw accurate pictures. You don't really want to draw accurate pictures. Instead, what you want to do is you want to draw pictures that are going to be pictures or diagrams that just let you see how many ways an event can occur and how it's connected to the other events so that you can see how there's things interrelated or not interrelated and how things can occur, the number of ways, branching paths, all those sorts of things. Drawing every single possibility, drawing really careful pictures, that's not necessarily the thing. You just want something so that you can visualize it and see it on paper. And we'll see a lot of this in the examples. All the examples will have some way of being able to visually understand what's going on. All right, now we're ready for some examples. First example, we've got seven shirts, three pairs of pants, and four pairs of shoes. What is the total number of outfits you can wear from this selection? So first thing to notice is if we're going to wear an outfit, we're going to have to wear shirts, pants, and shoes because we're going to go outside with it. So we want to have definitely a shirt, definitely, definitely pants, and we're walking outside, so we definitely want shoes as well. So we're going to have definitely a shirt, definitely pants, definitely shoes. Furthermore, our choice of shirt our choice of pants and our choice of shoes have nothing to do with each other, right? They might not look good together, but it would be a possible outfit we could create. So shirt is completely independent from pants is completely independent, independent from shoes. Each one is a choice completely in and of itself. They don't have effects on each other. So we can think of it as three separate events. First, we've got the seven shirts. So we've got the choices for shirts to begin with. And we've got seven possible things for shirts. And the next we have three pairs of pants. So there are a total of all of our pants choices. Our pants event is three different ways for our pants event to turn out. And then finally, four pairs of shoes. There are four different ways for our shoes event to turn out. We know that we have to wind up having uh, we're going to have a shoes event to turn out, and it can turn into four different possibilities. So we could think of this with branching, right? We dress ourselves, and so our first thing is we branch into multiple different choices with the shirts, and then from here we branch into multiple different choices with the pants, and that's going to wind up happening on each one of our blue things. So then if we wind up following out any one of these, we're going to branch on this. So on every branch, it branches seven times, and then each of those branch three times, and then each of those branch four times. That was our fundamental counting principle, the multiplication principle. Since they're independent events, they don't have anything to do with each other. We just multiply the number of possibilities for each one of them. So seven times three times four. We multiply this all out together, we wind up getting 84 possibilities. So we have a total of 84 different possible outfits. Great. Next question. We're going out to dinner tonight. You are going out to dinner tonight. I'm not coming with you. Your options for the restaurant are Mexican, Japanese, or French. At each restaurant, they have the following number of selections. Mexican has four appetizers, 10 main courses. Japanese has three appetizers, seven main courses. And French has eight appetizers and five main courses. If you will have one appetizer and one main course, how many ways are there for you to have dinner tonight? 
So the first thing we have to realize is that if we're going to go out to dinner, we can't go out to dinner at multiple restaurants at the same time, right? If you go out to dinner, you have to choose one restaurant. So our very first thing is we've actually got a restaurant choice. So restaurant breaks into three different possibilities. We can either go to the Mexican, the Japanese, or the French. So if we go to Mexican, we'll have that one here. And then we could also have gone to Japanese. And then finally, we could have gone to French. And then we were told that when we are out at dinner, when you are out at dinner, you are going to have one appetizer and one main course. Now, the choice of appetizer has no effect on the choice of main course necessarily, right? You could choose any appetizer to go with any main course. They might not fit together, but it doesn't matter. You could choose it. So they are independent events. One of them does not necessarily change the way the other one can turn out. So for the Mexican choice, if you went with Mexican, you would have four choices for your appetizer, and then you would have 10 choices for your main course, right? Four appetizers and then 10 main courses. Same thing for the Japanese, but different numbers. We have three choices. Let me make that a little bit bigger. So we have three choices for the appetizer, and then we have seven choices for the main course. Finally, the French restaurant, if you'd gone there, you would have eight choices for the appetizer and five choices for the main course. So if you had gone to Mexican, you would have four times 10 total possibilities at the Mexican restaurant. If you had gone to Japanese, you would have three times seven or 21 total possibilities if you'd gone to the Japanese restaurant. If you had gone to the French restaurant, you'd have eight times five or 40 possibilities if you'd gone to the French restaurant. But you don't have to go to any one of these necessarily. At the beginning, you've got this branching choice, right? You've got an exclusive choice where you can choose one of the restaurants, but you can't choose multiple of the restaurants. So you could go down Mexican and get to the Mexican set of choices. You could go down Japanese and get to the Japanese set of choices. Or you could go down French and get to the French set of choices. This means that we have to add the number of choices at each restaurant all together to figure out what the total choices for the night are. So we wind up having 40 from the Mexican plus 21 from the Japanese plus 40 from the French, which comes out to be a total of 40 plus 40, 80 plus 21, 101 choices. So you have 101 total choices for dinner tonight, total ways to have dinner because you could go to any of the three restaurants, and then once you're at each, th each of the restaurants, you then have an independent choice between appetizer and main course. So at the end, we have to add them back all up together. Next example. At a computer store, you're going to buy speakers, a monitor, and a computer. There are four options for speakers, seven for monitors, and two for computers. One of the computers gives a choice between one of two operating systems, while the other has one of three operating system options. So if you buy one of the computers, you can choose between one of two things on top of it. And if you buy the other computer, you're allowed to choose one of three things on top of it. How many total ways are there to make your purchase? Now, of course, if you buy a computer, you have to have an operating system with it. So we're guaranteed that we're going to get some operating system. So with that in mind, how can we figure out how many ways to make a purchase? Well, if we go in the order that this comes, we see that we have speakers. We buy speakers. And we've got how many ways? There are four options for speakers. So four options for speakers. And then we have the monitors. We look at it, we've got, oh, whoops, four options, not seven. I was accidentally reading monitors. Four for speakers, and then we have seven for monitors. And then the computers, you've got two options for the computers. But then we had this whole thing about the OS, the operating system of it. Our operating system comes into O as well. So operating system branches depending on which computer you had bought, right? If you bought the first computer or the second computer, you don't have different numbers of options here. So you could have two here or three here. So with that in mind, it gets a little confusing to figure out how we want to work this out. So let's have our first thing be the computer choice. We'll say computer choice determines everything else. Because speakers and monitors, they're completely independent of which computer you choose. The operating system choice, though, does depend on which computer you chose. So we'll start off with choosing computer choice. So we have our computer choice splits into one of two possibilities. So it splits into the 2 OS possibility, or it splits into the 3 OS possibility. So we've got the operating system. Over here, there's two possible operating systems. Over here, though, there are 
three possible operating systems. Next up, we've got speakers. For both of them, there's going to be four choices for speaker, four choices for speaker. And for monitor, we've got seven choices for the monitor, seven choices for the monitor, because that has no effect on which of the two computers we'd initially bought. So our computer, this number of choices too, doesn't really come into effect because we already counted it by having it branch two different ways. We've created that branching and now we're reading both of them. So what we do is we figure out how many options do we have if we had bought the two operating system computer? How many options do we have if we had bought the three operating system computer? And then we add those two together to figure out the total number that we have. So let's figure this out. If we have 2 times 4 times 7, 2 times 4 times 7, we wind up having 8 times 7, or 56 total options over here. If we had gone with the 3 operating system, then we had 3 times 4 times 7 possibilities if we bought the 3 operating system computer, so that comes out to 84 choices. So if we want to have the possibility of choosing between one of the two computers at first, well that changes what happens down the road, so we have to bring that has to count as a uh, either an or event. We can only choose one of the two. So we have the two operating system possibility at 56, the three operating system possibility at 84. If we want to be able to have an option between choosing which of those two paths we go down, we add them together. So we've got the 56 options for the two operating system added to the 84 op. 84 options for the three operating system. We add those together and we get 140 total possibility. So you have 140 total possible ways to make this purchase when we include all the different options that we've got at our disposal. Next example, on an exam there are 25 multiple choice questions, each one of them having five choices that you can answer with. Now assuming that we count not putting down any choice as an option for answering a question, because it is in a way, a way, a choice that you have made, right? Not putting anything down is a choice just as much as marking A or C or E. So if that's the case, we're going to assume that not putting down something counts as an option for answering a question. With that in mind, how many ways total are there to mark the answer sheet? So there are 25 different ways, different times that we have the chance to answer. So for our first one, well, let's look at it as we've got 25 different slots, effectively for each of our slots representing all of the choices that we have for answering. So this is going to keep going, 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 right? So there are a total of 25 slots that we're dealing with, because each of the questions is a slot that gets answered. OK, so with that in mind, we are going to say, how many ways can we answer the first question? Well, the first question, we are allowed to not, we count not putting down a choice. We count not putting a choice as an option. So if that's the case, and there are five choices, A, B, C, D, E for each one of these, and we count not putting down something as an additional option, then that means there is a total of six for one of these questions. A, B, C, D, E, nothing at all. So that's a total of six possibilities. What about the next question? Is the next question affected by the way that we answered the previous question? Not at all. You can mark that answer any way you want. Once again, we have A, B, C, D, E, nothing at all. So six choices on the next one, six choices on the next one, six choices, six choices. So six choices for each one of the 25 questions that we're answering. So six times six times six times six, because each one is an independent event, so we multiply them all together to figure out how many possible things there are. So what we've got is six times six times six, going all the way out to more sixes, right? So we've got a total of 25 different ways to say six, there are, sorry, a total of 25 sixes multiplied together. Well, on the bright side, we've got a nice way for saying six multiplied by six 25 times. That is the same thing as saying six to the 25th. So there are a total of six to the 25th ways to answer this set of questions. There's six to the 25th ways to mark up this answer sheet. How many does that come out to be? It's a little hard to see just how large 6 to the 25th is. 6 to the 25th, if we use a calculator to get an approximate value for that, that comes out to be 2.8 times 10 to the 19th possibilities, which is absolutely staggering number, right? That's a huge number. If we were to count this out, it would have 19 zeros, 1, 2, well, actually it would have 18 zeros because that 0.8. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and then the 2.8 
times that 10 to the 19th. So we'd wind up having this incredibly massive number of choices. I can't even figure out how many is that. That's ones, thousands, millions, billions, uh, trillions, quadrillions, 28 quintillion choices for the ways that we could answer this with only 25 questions. So that's a massive, massive number of possibilities here, which gives us an idea of just how fast things can grow, right? This is why we don't want to have to count this stuff by hand. It's because these numbers can get really big, really fast, and things that seem really simple. Cool. All right, final example, show that there are at least two people in London right now with the exact same number of hairs on their heads. This will require a little bit of research. So this is, seems like a kind of a weird thing at first. So we see this use the pigeonhole principle after researching. So that's gonna be a hint that we're gonna to wanna to use the pigeonhole principle. So a little bit before we get into this, let's consider the idea of if we were talking about birthdays, that will help us understand what's about to happen in just a moment. If we were talking about birthdays, if we had, there, let's say that there is only 365 days that you can be born on. We're forgetting about leap years because we're assuming that we slide that to either the day before or the day after. So there's 365 days that you can be born on. That means if we have 366 people in the same room, we are guaranteed that at least one pair of people there has the same birthday. Now, there might be more birthdays that are concurrent that people have the same birthday, but we can be guaranteed that there is at least one pair because if we've got 365 effective slots for a day that a birthday can be on. That's 365 boxes that a person can go into and represent I'm on that day. Then at least two people are going to wind up having to be in that same box. They're going to have to wind up occupying the same birthday. Otherwise, it just doesn't make sense, right? That's the pigeonhole principle in action. This idea that if we're stuffing things into pigeonholes being a, a little place for a message and long time ago, if we stuff two things into the same, if we stuff, you know, 10 messages into nine pigeonholes, there's going to have to be some pigeonhole that has multiple messages in it, right? At least two messages. So if we have 366 people, we know that there's going to be at least two people who have the same birthday. That's the basic idea here. Now, now let's start thinking about this one. So we're talking about hairs on heads. We're talking about London. So first, let's look into hairs on head. So we look into how many hairs are on a human head. So the number of head, a, a human head, assuming they have a reasonably full head of hair. So a human head with full hair has around 100,000 hairs on it about 100,000 hairs. Now, of course, this number can be higher, this number can be lower, but it doesn't get much higher than 100,000. Like 200,000, pretty much no one's going to have 200,000 hairs. So it gets, it starts to limit out pretty quickly. So around 100,000 hairs is about the normal amount for a human head, and 150,000 would be a lot of hair. More than that just starts to become ridiculous and really hard. We figure that out with just a little bit of internet research, some curs cursory research. We figure out pretty quickly, eh, it looks to be about 100,000. So at that point, we didn't do really, really careful scientific study, so we wanna make sure that we're you know, giving some extra leeway here. So let's say, from this idea, the absolute maximum number of hairs that can be on a human head, the absolute max is going to be Let's just say it's a million hairs. There can't be more than a million hairs on a human head. So there have to be a million hairs or less on a human head. You can be anywhere between zero, right? You can't have less than zero hairs on your head, up to a million. And a million is actually a ridiculously large number. No one's gonna actually have a million at all. But let's set it up to a high point that's ridiculous, because if we can show that this is true, even with this ridiculous amount of hair, we'll have proved it for a smaller, more accurate thing, what the real world would actually be. So we can set a higher set. Next idea is let's look at the population in London. So the population, in London, as of the writing of this video, the population in London is a little bit over eight million. Right? It's around 8.1 million, a little more than that. So it's around eight million, it's over eight million. Because of this, we now know by the pigeonhole principle that there are at least two people in London who have the exact same number of hairs on their head. Why? Well, let's look at it like this. So we can think of that absolute maximum of one million hairs as being a bunch of different boxes, right? The number of hairs on a person's head. So this goes all the way out to, we've got zero hairs at first, one hair on your head, two hairs on your head, three hairs on your head, four hairs on your head, and then 999,999 ,999 hairs on your head, one million hairs on your head, 
So we've got all of these different boxes that a person can go into, right? We're counting all the way up from zero up until one million hairs. We know that if it's a human, they're going to have to go in one of these boxes because the absolute maximum number of hairs, and this is a ridiculous number, would be that a person has a million hairs on their head. So that's too large, but we know that the absolute maximum number of boxes that we have to have here is from zero up into a million to mark out the number of hairs on a head. Now, we know that the population of London is over 8 million. That means when we go through the first 1 million and 1 people, then they're each at, unless they already wind up having the two people having the same number of ha hairs on their heads in the first million and one people. Then we're going to go all the way up from zero to a million with each person having a unique number of hairs on their head. But as soon as we get to the million and second person, they're going to wind up having to go into the same box as someone else. Someone else will wind up having to have that same box with somebody else. They'll have to share. So we've got the exact same number of hairs guaranteed. We know right this moment in London, there are somewhere in there two people who have the exact same number of hairs on their head. Pretty wild. In fact, because it's over 8 million, we could show that there are, in fact, at least 8 people who have the exact same number of hairs on their head right this instant. Kind of surprising. I won't prove why that has to be the case, but if you think about, the, for this, think about this for a little while, you'll probably be able to figure it out on your own. Pretty cool. Now, of course, there's no like practical application to this immediately. We couldn't actually find these two people with any ease. But it is interesting to know that there's this guarantee that because there are so darn many people in London, and there's just not that many hairs on the human head, there are more people in London than there can be hairs on the human head, it must wind up being that two people have the same number of hairs on your head, hairs on their heads. So that's one way to apply the pigeonhole principle that allows us to show these really kind of surprising, strange results with not that much difficulty. All right, cool. We'll see you at educator.com later. Bye.